Well, it's great on our four-year birthday to open up to Acts chapter 6 with you. Our regular diet of preaching is to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse through books of the Bible, and we find ourselves in Acts chapter 6. And uh, this is a little bit of a spicy text. It's got a little sriracha on it. Uh, It might not look very controversial to you at first, but it's controversial, I promise you. We have starving widows. We have systemic racism. We have all kinds of crazy stuff happening in the early church, along with a lot of growth, and we get to jump in it together. You see, in this text, a problem arises in the early church, a serious problem. The Hellenistic widows, which means the Greek-speaking widows, are being neglected. They're going hungry because the church is growing rapidly. And so I've entitled this sermon, Growing Pains. Not the show, the sermon. And uh, as I read this text, it got me thinking, actually. So I have three boys under the age of five. Yeah, pray for me. And my family has been growing uh, slowly year by year. And I remember when I had my first son, Aiden, who's four now. And those of you who've had your first kid, do you remember, like, leaving the hospital and thinking, like, we're allowed to go? (laughs) <laughs> like there's no supervisor watching us. And you remember like putting your kid to bed and watching them sleep? Are they breathing? Is everything okay? You know, like when I, my first son Aiden, like I'm feeding him organic gluten-free peas, you know, like cost $20 for this little jar. But things change, right, as you grow, as your family grows. We had our second son, then our third son. And now, with three boys in the house, I'm not worried about organic peas. I grab a cheese stick and throw it at them and say, you guys fight over dinner. (laughs) You know, with Aiden, I'm like, he's a week old. I'm like, oh my gosh, is he developmentally progressing? Can he count yet? Now with my third, I'm like, here's Blippi. (laughs) Here's Paw Patrol, you know. (laughs) Um, Things change as you grow, right? And... Certainly having three sons is amazing. I mean, we wrestling together, reading books together, just moments together, the, the four of us, me and my three boys, are pretty special. But with, those, with that growth comes challenges as well. When I found out we're having our third, I was like, that's great, but we can't fit all these kids in my car right now. We got to get a new car. We got to figure out a bedroom situation. Growth brings blessing, it brings opportunity, but it also brings problems, right? Challenges. And so it is in the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 6. This is a rapidly growing church family in Jerusalem. And they're growing so fast that they're facing some internal strains. And that's why this passage is so helpful for us as a church that is growing. We see some really important lessons here in this passage. I mentioned earlier we're celebrating four years as a church, and we've grown a lot in four years. Four years ago, we were 10 people in my living room doing a Bible study. And now RCC is easily 225 people this morning. It's one of the largest churches in Baltimore City. And so we're experiencing some of these growing pains that the early church had in Acts. Maybe not to the same degree, but we're experiencing them. And so this is relevant for us, and we need to adjust and prioritize what's most, as we, what's most important as we grow. Look at verse 1 with me. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number... A complaint by the Hellenists arose. These days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose. That's a pretty common problem, isn't it? The church is growing and people are complaining. Typical problem. Now there are three lessons at least we can learn from this whole passage. Number one, a godly growing church receives complaints but celebrates growth. A godly growing church drifts mono-ethnic but fights to be multi-ethnic. And thirdly, a godly growing church gets overwhelmed, but equips new leaders. Let's start with number one. A godly growing church receives complaints, but celebrates growth. The book of Acts helps us understand church growth. There are a lot of people who are really negative about a church that's big or a church that's growing. Well, they would not like the church in Acts because it grows quickly and it gets big. People have said to me before, like, you guys are all about the numbers. 
Or they'll say, you don't care enough about the existing people, you care too much about the new people. But this whole section is surrounded, it's bracketed in verses 1 through 7 with numbers, with growth, with new people. Verse 1 says, now in these days when the disciples were what? Increasing in number. Verse 7, the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. Luke is showing us that a growing church isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's something to celebrate. You turn to your Bible, at the front of your Bible, you notice there's Genesis, then Exodus, then Leviticus, and then Numbers. Like, it's a book in the Bible, man. Like, numbers aren't bad. It's in the Bible. So, let's be really careful to say growth or numbers aren't important. Healthy things tend to grow, right? If your kid wasn't growing, you'd be like, what's wrong? And if a church isn't growing, we should be asking, what's wrong? And what you have here is an indication throughout Acts and other places that people were counted. There's counting going on. You remember Acts 2, 3,000 people get baptized? How many people got baptized, Peter? Oh, we don't count. We're we're the church. Numbers don't matter. No! One, two, three, all the way to 3,000. That's how many people got baptized. Give God glory. That's awesome. And we count here, too. Our hospitality team counts every week. And you might ask, like, why would we do that? It's not about numbers, right? We count people because people count. Each number represents a potential changed life. This is why numbers matter. And it's not just in the book of Acts. In Acts, I know Luke is constantly counting. Like, there are at least 10 statements of the growth of the church in Acts. Scholars estimate that in Acts chapter 6, there's 20,000 people in the church. But it's not just Acts, it's also in Revelation. John describes heaven. Revelation 9, he says, I looked and behold a great what? Multitude. That no one can number. If you don't like numbers, if you don't like growth, you're not going to like heaven. It's so big you can't even count them. From every nation, all tribes, peoples, and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. You see, Jesus loves growth. Jesus loves numbers. Because Jesus loves people, and heaven's going to be full of them. And so our growth at RCC is a contribution to the great growth, the great multitude we will one day see in heaven. So we celebrate it, like Luke does here in verses 1 and verses 7. When the Bible is being faithfully preached, and the gospel is being boldly proclaimed, and lost people are coming to know the great Savior, we should be happy. We should rejoice. Because the kingdom of God is breaking into this broken world. And we're getting a little taste of heaven, aren't we? This is good. It's not bad. Now, I need to say too, though, not all growth is good growth. Not every church that's growing is healthy, right? Not every church that's growing is built on the right foundations. The Bible, the gospel. It's one thing to grow a crowd... And it's another thing to build a church. You know, I like, it's not too hard to grow a crowd. We can grow a crowd just getting some dancing chihuahuas on the stage. I can learn to juggle and speak at the same time. Say some funny jokes. People will probably come. We can grow a crowd with a good self-help talk, with music that accompanies it, can't we? That's not building a church. And to build a church, you need to preach the Bible. You need to share the good news of the gospel, the news of complete salvation through faith in Christ by grace alone and faith alone. And as people are saved, we count all on the way, giving God all the glory. Because each number is an eternity changed. And I recognize not everyone desires a growing, bigger church. Why? Because growth interrupts your rhythms, your comforts, your inner circle, your routine, right? Joel, who was playing Cajon this morning, used to be in my gospel community. And I miss seeing Joel every week in my gospel community. We don't meet in gospel community anymore because we multiplied. It was getting too big. And now he leads a group in Catonsville. And I miss him. 
He's got three sons. I got three sons. And I keep telling him, my three sons are going to crush your three sons at basketball. <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> Growth can hurt sometimes, can it? It can be frustrating to come in this room and be like, man, I got nowhere to sit. Where are those people coming from? Get out of here. This is my church. You're in my seat. And that's why when a church is growing, people are complaining. Because it interrupts our lifestyles. It interrupts our comforts. But I long for the day when our people look a little bit more like Luke. Look a little bit more like Jesus. When the room is full of lost people, ready to hear the word preached and the gospel proclaimed, they say, Pastor, why don't we start a new service? We've got to handle all these new people. When are we going to plant a new church? We want to reach more people. That's the heart of Luke in the book of Acts. Jesus loves growth, and we should do. You know, Jesus actually taught a parable in Matthew 13, 47 to 50, a parable of a net catching a lot of fish. You ever seen a guy throw a net in this ocean and pull out a bunch of fish, but inside the net is also like a spare tire? What the heck is that doing here? Growth, a great catch, always comes with some junk. That's the point of his parable. If you catch a lot of fish, there's going to be a mess with it. There's going to be good fish, there's going to be bad fish, and Jesus says, I'll sort all of it out on the last day. See, he assumes that whenever you catch a lot of fish, there's going to be issues, there's going to be drama, there's going to be, there's going to be some genuine believers and some believers who look like Ananias and Sapphira a few chapters earlier in Acts who weren't really Christians. And we'll, we'll see later on in Acts many more problems associated with growth. In Acts chapter 18, the gospel spreads even to Asia, and we find that there are doctrinal confusions going on in the church. There's this hotshot preacher named Apollos who's preaching wrong doctrine. So Priscilla and Aquila got to bring them in their house and say, yo, Apollos, you're a great preacher, but this doctrine is wrong. See, new preachers, new leaders, new churches, new growth create problems. In Acts 19, the gospel reaches Ephesus, and there's this black magic that's entering into the life of the church, and they got to sort it out, get rid of it. Growth brings problems. So we should remember this, that growth always makes things messier, there's always more problems, more drama, more challenges. Just look at my house. It was a lot cleaner with one kid. Now we got three. It is a danger zone up in there. Growth brings challenges. I think the other thing we need to remember, friends, is that as we look at this passage, it's a mistake to romanticize or idealize the church in the book of Acts as if it didn't have any problems. Is Acts a model church? Yeah. Is it a perfect church? Absolutely not. Did the early church have a lot of wins? Are you kidding me? Yeah. We got Peter's shadow healing people. We got 3,000 baptisms. That's a lot of wins. Did it fail anything? Yeah. This that we just read is a failure. Like the leaders of the early church were failing royally. The text tells us that there are starving widows. Does it get any more vulnerable than that? A starving widow. That is a problem, especially since James will say later in James 1, true religion is to care for orphans and widows. So we're not practicing true religion here in Acts chapter 6. Like, could you imagine if you were listening to my sermon right now and the person next to you was a widow who hadn't eaten all week? That would be a problem, right? Now, you can say what you want about our church, but our widows have full stomachs. That's a win. You see, what this is showing us is that even the best churches, perhaps even the best church, has failures sometimes. Like, where do you go to church? You know, I go to the one in Acts, the one where 3,000 people got saved on launch Sunday. Oh, wow, who's your pastor? Apostle Peter. His shadow heals people. Pretty cool. <laughs> he walked by me the other day, and I think my teeth got a little whiter. Oh, yeah, I know that church. You mean the one where the widows are starving? Yeah, that one. And, like, what are you going to say if you're part of that church? I'm leaving? Or this church needs new leadership? You can't really say that, right? The apostles were commissioned and appointed by Jesus Christ himself. And there are no other churches that are options. You can't go down the street to First Baptist Jerusalem. Where else are you going to go? You know, our, our pastors, 
they don't actually do the Bible. We got hungry widows. They wrote the Bible. <laughs> like, how do you improve on that leadership? And yet, they have a failure. Just think about that, friend. Even the best churches fail sometimes. Even the best leaders fail sometimes. I was talking to a friend who's on staff at a mega church in America somewhere. He, he, the lead pastor of that church is one of the most renowned preachers, communicators in the nation right now. If I said his, the preacher's name, you would know the name. He's godly man, Christ-centered, Bible-driven, great preacher. But my friend who works with them told me this week, working with him, this preacher, drives me insane. Yeah, he's a world-class preacher, but he's a horrible leader. Like our church is sprawling right now because we're so unorganized. And you wouldn't know that because you just listened to his sermons, and he's a great preacher. And my point is that from the first century to the 21st century, even the best churches, the best leaders, the best preachers have problems, have issues, have challenges, have unique good things. We use a framework here at RCC called triperspectivalism, which uses three major categories from the Old Testament to identify leaders. The categories are prophet, priest, king. You can use this framework if you're a member as well. Basically, prophets are people who love the Bible, who listen to sermons on their way to work, and a sermon on their way home from work. They love to read the Bible, they love to be taught the Bible, they love to teach the Bible. Then there are priests, and these kind of folks wake up thinking about people. They love talking to people, praying for people, hugging people, having people over their house. They just love people. And then you have kings. Those are the people who love Excel. Praise God for those people. That is not me. They're all about systems and structures and execution. And we need to recognize that there is only one person who's a prophet, priest, and king. And his name is Jesus. It's not Adam, it's not Adam, it's not David, it's not Thomas. And on our pastoral team, myself and Pastor David Whistle lean more prophet. This is why I preach most Sundays. This is why Pastor Whistle leads RCC 101, which is our intro to membership class. Pastor Adam Wilson is a priest. He's like the Mr. Rogers of our group. He's gentle. He's loving. This morning, he came up to me. He started massaging my back. And I'm like, ooh, I love this man. <laughs> and we need some priests up in here, right? Priest is the guy you call when you're in trouble, when you need help. And then we have Pastor Thomas Yoon, who's more kingly. He's got the spreadsheets. He's got the game plan. We just do what he says most of the time. And we defer to one another in our unique areas of gifting and leadership. All the while, looking at the great prophet, priest, and king, Jesus Christ, who is our senior pastor. And we are under shepherds of the great shepherd. And the same thing is happening here in this text. The apostles are prophets. They lean more teaching. They've been commissioned by Jesus to teach, to preach the gospel. But the shadow side of this incredible gifting, and it was incredible, wasn't it? I mean, all these stories are phenomenal. But the shadow side is that they neglected the needy. They neglected the widow. And this is a reality for us, too. I mean, this is why I don't lead the counseling ministry at RCC. You don't want me to counsel you because you'll tell me your problem and I'll say, stop it. Do this instead. Pastor Wilson will hold your hand and gently lead you by the still waters of God's grace. <laughs> He'll help you figure out the answer by yourself. And I'm like, shut up. Here's what you need to do. <laughs> and praise God for our different giftings, right? We have different callings. And so it was with the Church of Acts. And we, we learn from this. We find encouragement in this. If that church had a few problems, a few significant problems, might you expect one, two, or three here at our church? Yeah. And hear me. This is important. Just remember that there is a difference between a sin and a human limitation. There's a difference between a sin and a human limitation or a human weakness. Why aren't the apostles caring for widows? Do they not love widows? Of course they love widows. The issue is they don't have enough bandwidth. 
They're humans. And so many church members today are looking at wrung out church leaders and yelling at them saying, work harder, do more. As if a pastor's life is a cruel, never-ending game of whack-a-mole. Their life's purpose is to find and fix every problem in the church and in the city. Well, good luck with that. Honestly, ask yourself, how many hours do you want your pastors or your church leaders to work? Is it 40 hours or 100 hours? And set your expectations in alignment with that. One researcher named Tom Rainer found that when you total up all the hours church members expect their pastor to work, it totals up to 114 hours a week working. That leaves you enough time to just work and just sleep. Seven hours a night. Like, do you want your pastors to have a relationship with their family? A relationship with their children? Do you want them to have hobbies? Do you want them to take vacations? Do you want leaders and pastors to last for four years or 40 years? And if you want healthy, well-rounded church leaders, you need to have realistic expectations based on their limited bandwidth, limited experience, and limited skills. And we need to show grace to one another, friends. Instead of zooming in on the problem you see and what's wrong with the church, we should, like Luke does in Acts in verses 1 and 7, and zoom out and look at the problem in the context of celebrating all that God is doing. Like, there's a ton of stuff going right. And we should be very careful assigning motive to people when we think they're not meeting our expectations. Maybe they're just human beings stuck in a sinful world. Scholars say, that a lot of Christians have what's called an overrealized eschatology. Fancy way of saying, we want heaven right now, don't we? This church should look like heaven. So when a widow goes hungry, or an orphan isn't adopted, or a ministry isn't started yet, we blame the pastor. And maybe instead we should blame Satan. And recognize your leaders are humans. And so an encouragement to you, if you lead anything in RCC, Recognize that the ministry you lead will never be perfect. It wasn't perfect for the apostles. It can't be perfect for you. And we do not need to be overly offended by complaints or by grumblings. They happen to the apostles. They don't happen to us. And the good news is that sometimes God will use these complaints or these grumblings actually to grow us or to grow our ministry like we'll see here in Acts 6. The church improves because of these complaints. It gets better. A new ministry is started. And if you're a member or you call RCC home, Recognize that your leaders are working themselves to the bone right now. We are trying to handle all this growth. There are a ton of people who want to meet with us, to talk with us, to have us start a ministry or do something in the city. That's all great stuff, but we're human beings. We can't do it all. And if the apostles failed sometimes at this, could you perhaps have some grace for us when we fail? Recognize that your pastors or your gospel community leader, your stoop group leader, or a staff member or any church leader... He's working probably like 80 hours a week, doing everything they can. And if the only time they hear from you is a complaint, that can be deflating. So choose your complaints wisely. I think starving widows falls in the category of wise complaint. We should complain about that and fix that, right? But maybe the fact that we started gospel community five minutes late, I'll let that one go. A lot of stuff that people complain about is a result of unrealistic expectations. And we need to be realistic with our expectations and have more grace with one another. Be more patient. Be more grateful. I was actually uh, listening to Shannon Sharp talk last week. He's a Hall of Fame tight end, played tight end for the Ravens. He won a Super Bowl for us. And he was talking about how when he made it to the league, he had always promised his mama, he calls her his mama, a new Mercedes. Mama, I'm going to get you a Mercedes. So he got to the league, he got our Mercedes. And then he talked to his grandmama and said to her, Grandma, what do you want? You want a new car like my mom? And his grandma was like, uh, I don't know how to drive. I'm good. <laughs> All right, Grandma, you want some jewelry? No, no, I don't want jewelry. What do you want, Grandma? I want a decent house. Okay, what's, describe a decent house. And she said, I want the good Lord to set rain all night and be able to wake up in the morning dry. That's a decent house. And Shannon Sharp was like, I can do that. And we need more church members 
like Shannon Sharp's grandma. I want a decent pastor. What do you mean by decent? He prays and he preaches the gospel. I'm satisfied. <laughs> Let's be a people like Shannon Sharp's grandma, like Luke, hearing complaints, limiting complaints, and celebrating growth. God's doing something here. We should be happy. A godly growing church receives complaints but celebrates growth. Secondly, it drifts monoethnic but fights to be multi-ethnic. Notice with me in end of verse 1, Luke points out the ethnicities of both of these groups. He says, a complaint by the Hellenists, these are the Greek Gentile believers, arose against the Hebrews. These are the majority Jewish believers. I want you to notice with me right away that the church is not colorblind. It's not colorblind. Like, the church doesn't start and they don't begin pretending ethnicities or race or different cultures no longer exist or don't matter anymore. The church was never meant to be colorblind and say, let's just forget about our ethnicities and worship Jesus together. Like, you might notice if you had dark skin before you came to Christ, you still got dark skin. Jesus didn't change that. If you had light skin before you came to Christ, you still got light skin. Jesus didn't change that. When I became a Christian, I didn't look any less like Aladdin. You see, the gospel takes us in our rich diversity and it builds us together into something brand new. It does not flatten out our diversity. We see here that God does not tell Jews to suddenly become Gentiles or just Gentiles to become Jews to fix the problem of racial disunity. No. He builds a new diverse church family that is united under King Jesus that is a rich mosaic of all the colors of humanity. Like who's there at the end in Revelation chapter 7? It's not like we get to heaven and, oh wait, everyone's colorless. No, you get to Revelation 7 and God's church is not mono-ethnic, it's a multi-ethnic new humanity. So we see in Revelation and in Acts 6, your ethnicity, your skin color, your culture is not a part of the fall. It's a part of God's great redemptive tapestry that he is building into something glorious. If you're a person of color, I want you to hear this. You need to hear this. Your skin color, your ethnicity is not less than. It's not a result of sin. It's not going to be thrown away in the new creation. It is God's rich design that will be displayed magnificently before the heavenly realms to the glory of God. God is the father of every Christian in this room. All of our spiritual birth certificates say Abba on it. My friend Doug Logan likes to say, if every Christian was on the Maury Povich show or the Jerry Springer show, they would open the envelope and say, God, you are the father. <laughs> Knowing that we are different ethnicities brought into one family, I want you to see this crazy scene in the Bible. Like this is something you would never see in culture today. A minority ethnic group in the church, the Hellenists, approaches the majority ethnic group, the Jews, and says, we have a problem. What's the problem? End of verse 1. The, their widows, meaning the Greek-speaking widows, just them, were being neglected in the daily distribution. The minority widows are being neglected. I want to give you some context and idea of what this actually, the significance of this in our context. You and I live in Baltimore, which is a predominantly black city. It's 60% black. Now, this neighborhood, Canton, is 90% white. That's crazy, right? Why the difference? If you look back at our history, there's a bunch of racist policies over the last few decades called redlining that separated neighborhoods by skin color. If you were black, you were said to detract the value of the neighborhood if you moved in. You weren't allowed to get a bank loan for a mortgage. In fact, Wells Fargo just settled a lawsuit against black citizens in Baltimore for decades refusing to give them bank loans. And what this resulted in is most of the poor, predominantly black neighborhoods in our city were neighborhoods that were redlined. Now, those policies may no longer exist, but the effects still do. And this is why you can see racism on a map in Baltimore City. 
Now, considering all this, I would argue that the city is pretty segregated already. Our church is one of the more diverse spaces you can enter in Ken. That being said, I recognize that our leadership is predominantly white. If you go on our website, you see our deacons, our, our staff, most of us are white. I'm half white, half Arab, some mixed. Now, that context in your mind, imagine with me if the white widows in our church were being prayed for, visited, provided for, had full stomachs, but the black widows in our church were being completely neglected. That would be an issue. It would be more than an issue. It would be a, a story of the Baltimore Sun. There would be protests. Rightly so. Many of you would leave. That's what's happening in Acts chapter 6. You see the significance of this? You see how crazy this is? And they're going to eventually fix this widow issue. The minority widows are going to be taken care of. But that does not mean that racial tension within the church ends in Acts chapter 6. Bro, they cannot agree that Gentile Christians are fully in the family of God until Acts chapter 15. That's nine chapters later. To say we're all one under Christ. You don't have to do anything. You just need to believe in Jesus. You see, even the healthiest church had systemic racism, struggled with deep racial tension. For those of you in this room who are white, perhaps the best way I can explain this is, if you're a man, have you ever been to a, a woman's bridal shower and you're the only guy there? It's awkward. You're constantly asking questions like, am I welcome here? You feel different. It can be disorienting. Am I wanted here? And it can mean everything if the bride at the bridal party says to you, I'm so glad you're here. You're wanted here. Hey, come here. Will you help me with this event of the party? And for a lot of our black brothers and sisters in the church, they feel the same way. I spoke with my friend One. He's a black church planner in South Africa. He planted a church where apartheid began in South Africa. And he told me that every time he enters into a Christian white space, he's constantly asking the question, am I really wanted here? If he gets treated poor, poorly, he's always asking, is it because of my skin color? Am I really equal here? Do I have a seat at the table here? And so if you're here and you're white, I want you to recognize that your brothers and sisters of color face struggles like these that you will never face. And the scriptures say it's our job to bear the burden with them and for them. They're not on their own in this. And so, if you're white and you hear that you, or perhaps even our church, might be discriminating against a minority in some way, let me ask you, are you shocked and defensive? Or are you compassionate and ready to learn? And if the church in Acts struggle with this, what makes you think you never do? If Peter in Galatians 3 has to be publicly rebuked in the Bible for not sitting next to Gentile Christians, might you have some racism in your heart to repent of? Why would we be shocked at this when it's so common in the Bible? And I know, I know we live in a society that will threaten to cancel you for seeing any hint of racism in your life. And I just want to say to you, not in RCC, you see that Jesus' blood covers every sin, even racism. And so if you confess racism, we will repent together. We will not shackle you and call you a bigot. We will preach good news to you. You, know, you may not be in leadership, but you will receive grace. And so we want to be an organization, a church that repents of racism together and individuals that repent of racism together. Not hide it. And if you're here today and you're a person of color, can I just say to you, you are wanted here. Not just so you make our website look better. Not so you can be the multicultural window dressing of the church. Because we actually need you. You have a seat at the table. Like the Hellenists, the minority group in the early church, who point out a problem in the church in Acts, we need you to point out our problems. 
We need your insight. We need your leadership because you see what many others do not. And I just want to say to you, if you're a person of color who's felt othered at RCC, different, like a man at a bridal shower, know that this happened even at the best church. And know that we want to fight against that kind of culture. We want to know if you feel this way. Because it's contrary to the promises of the gospel, which tears down the dividing wall of hostility and makes all of God's people equal at the table with Jesus at the head. And I'm going to get some pushback for this, but honest question for you. If the church in Acts was your church, brother or sister of color, if your people group was being discriminated against, this blatantly, would you have stayed or left? And can I just say, isn't it so much more like Christ to stay? To help people change and grow and see what they do not see? I know this is so countercultural, but didn't Christ stay with you? Didn't he come to die for you when you offended him? When you discriminated against him? And if you do leave, how will the church ever become this diverse family God says he desires it to be? And I'm so glad these minority believers stayed in the church. They powered through the offenses and loved people who were unlovable at times. And it, they didn't just stay. If you read the rest of the verses, what's interesting is that the leaders that are appointed, these, these deacons, these servant leaders, who are appointed to meet the need of these poor Hellenistic widows, they all have Greek-speaking names. And what that means is that all of these deacons, these servant leaders that are appointed, were minorities in the church. So the minority group in the church didn't just stay. They saw the neglect of the people of their ethnicity, and they stepped up and met that need themselves. That is countercultural in our world, isn't it? And in the same way, we need minority groups in our church, in leadership, with a seat at the table to help make this church the best it can be. Uh, last week, I, one of our gospel community leaders, Michael Opraku, who's from Ghana, had a naming ceremony for his daughter, Asai. And in Ghanaian culture, uh, the woman, the, the mother who gives birth to the child, stays in their home, doesn't leave their home until the naming ceremony. And this is like a month after the birth of Michael's daughter, and his whole family flew in. We had a bunch of people from the church in their little row home, and everyone wears white, which is just baller, by the way. So we have this row home packed at this naming ceremony, this Ghanaian naming ceremony. And uh, Michael's father, the grandfather of the, the little girl who was just born, holds up Asai and says, this is Asai Praku. And he starts praying for her and says, when God calls your name, may she answer. May she turn to Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Then he took a spoonful of wine and poured it in her mouth. I was like, this is interesting. <laughs> and said, this wine represents the blood of Jesus. And as it touches your lips, I say, may the blood of Jesus touch your tongue. May you never tell a lie. And may you always follow Jesus. And we all took turns praying for this little girl. And I left this ceremony thinking, man, I want to be Ghanaian. This is awesome. I come home. My wife wasn't able to come with me, so I come home, and I pick up my son, Aiden Mutasif. <laughs> you are Aiden Sufyan Mutasif. May you turn and follow Jesus when he calls your name. Give me some wine, woman. She was like, what are you doing? May he never tell a lie. And I, I just want to tell you, like being around a different culture, I saw gaps in my own fatherhood, in my own culture. See, I, I'm learning that there are moments in my parenting that need more honor, more significance, more dignity. In my American culture, which is like, oh, here's the baby, all right, peace, you got some gifts for me, peace. I want to become more like the Ghanaians. And you see, you and I need this. Our church needs this. 
Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And my friend, Dr. Walter Strickland, who's a black professor at Southeastern Seminary, he says, iron sharpens iron best across lines of indifference. Of difference, excuse me. So let's be a church, let's be a people who value other cultures and learn from them. And if you're a person of color, you're welcome at our table, and we want you to lead with us. A godly growing church receives complaints but celebrates growth, drifts monoethnic but fights to be multi-ethnic, I'm going to zoom through this last one, gets overwhelmed but equips new leaders. Now, it's obvious these apostles cannot do it all, so they say in verse 2, and they, the 12 apostles summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right, notice that strong language, that is pretty intense, it is not right that we should give up the preaching of the word of God to serve tables. They're saying the widows do need to be cared for, but we cannot be the ones to do it. And <laughs> it's easy to move past this one, guys, but can you imagine if you were here this morning and a hungry widow who had not eaten all week came up to me and I said, Sister, I care about your need. I am not the one to meet this need. What would you say to me? That's what the apostles say. And again, it's not because they don't care. They're just locked into what God called them to do and who God made them to be. And so what do they do? They equip new leaders in the church to meet that need. Verse 3, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. They equip new leaders to meet that need. And I imagine some folks didn't like that. Like this random guy named Timon shows up. Timon? Where's Pumbaa? I don't want Timon. I don't want Timon preaching. I don't want him delivering my food. I want Peter. Where's the apostle Peter? Now we got Timon this morning. A lot of people don't like the equipping of new leaders because it needs new faces. But we need to do it. And I've seen this at RCC. You know, when we started four years ago, uh, you know, as one of the main church planners, I, I did everything. I was a preacher. I was a counselor. I was the greeter at the door. I went to Kinko's to make the copies. Sometimes Adam Wilson went for us. You're uh, doing premarital counseling. You're setting up the chairs. Like, you are everything if you're the, church, you're the church planner. But you can only do that for so long because then you reach Saturday morning and you're like, I haven't started my sermon yet. And I haven't had a day off. And I haven't prayed much this week. And that's what these apostles are struggling with. And that's actually what kills men in ministry. That's what kills church plants, leaders who are trying to do everything. You know, I coach a lot of church planters. I speak at a lot of church planting events. And I've found that the greatest threat to a church plant is not in a church planter's immorality. It's a church planter who doesn't equip other leaders. And they get burnt out doing everything, and they give up. It's a failure to keep priorities in order. It's a failure to say no sometimes. It's a failure to keep the main thing the main thing. And this is why I tell guys who want to pastor or plant a church, your job is not to do, it's to equip the members. Like the apostles, you are responsible for preaching and prayer. Why? Because if you don't preach the gospel, then we don't got a church. And so the pastors the leaders are called to preach and pray and then unleash the members to meet needs. Hear this, if you went to the apostles and complained to them about, we don't have a men's ministry yet, or we don't have enough social justice work going on in the city, or whatever your complaint is, you know what they would say to you? All right, you're right, you lead the ministry. Or find someone qualified to lead it. That's what they would say to you. And people don't like that. But it's faithfulness to God we're after and not faithfulness to man. And so that's what the church does. Verse 5, and what they said pleased the whole gathering. Apparently the church eventually got on board with this. And they, they being the church, the church chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And this is what happens when we equip new leaders. We develop guys like Stephen, who's going to be a hero next week. We develop guys like Philip, who's going to be a, a church planner savant throughout the book of Acts both of whom are heroes of the faith. And if we did not equip new leaders, if we did not value gospel equipping, we would not have people in our church like Pastor David Whistle, who came to RCC as a lukewarm believer, and now he's a pastor. 
and he's going to be sent to the second most unreached people group in the world, to Japan, to plant a church. Gospel equipping results in new ministers sent out. We would not have people like Jules who sang this morning, like one of my favorite voices in the world. She's, <laughs> Megan said, amen. We equipped her, and now she's leading the pre-morning huddle before the service this morning. We would not have people like Amy, one of our deacons, who leads out in ministry to widows. She helped bring the check to the widow in our church who was, needed help. She organized the meal train. She took care of all the logistics. We would not have people like Orlando and Tiffany who hope to plant a church in Towson. Gospel equipping actually brings God more glory because if one superstar is doing everything, we can just say he's the reason it's awesome. But if everyone is doing something, we have to say only God can get the glory. And so if you're an attender at RCC, when you see a problem that bothers you, do you bring it to the pastors for them to fix it? Or do you come ready and willing to be a part of the solution? Peter will later write himself in 1 Peter 4 about the church. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. That's what your gifts are for, friend, to serve one another in the church. As good stewards of God's very grace, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So you've got two categories here, those who are gifted in speaking and those who are gifted in serving, both of them using their gifts for the building up the body. And we do what he says in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I think these are helpful categories for us. Many of you have serving gifts. Many of you have speaking gifts. If you've got speaking gifts, lead a stoop group. Lead a gospel community. Help with foundations. If you have serving gifts, start a ministry for the orphan in the city through our church. Help with the sound team. Whatever gift you have, use it for the glory of God. Don't just go to leaders and say, this needs to improve. Step up and improve it. But make sure if you do that, you meet the qualifications that you are of good repute as the apostles say, meaning good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. And maybe you need a little time to get there. And friends, this is what membership is. Membership is not you coming on Sunday morning listening to me talk. Membership is saying, I'm here. This is my home. I want to be full of the Holy Spirit, and I want to use my gifts to serve so that in everything Jesus may be glorified. And if you're a leader in our church... We need to be people who hand off ministry. Every leader in the church should not be primarily asking, what am I doing, but who am I equipping? Who's the next Timon in Pumbaa? Who's the next Stephen? Who's the next Procurus? Procurus, he sounds like he should be on the worship team. He could sing the chorus. I'm here all day, guys. You see, our hope is to turn pagan Pete's into Pastor Pete's. And this requires patience, friends. Patience. Leadership development is like a good brisket. It needs some time in the smoker and some seasoning. You can take it out early if you want, but that's going to be nasty. You don't appoint leaders fast. You can't do every ministry in a church plant right away. We prioritize what matters most, prayer and preaching, and we add ministries over time. Verse 6. These they set before the apostles, these leaders, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So the church appointed these leaders and commissioned them to serve to meet this need in the name of Jesus. And may it be so in our church. May people step up and care for the widow, for the orphan, for the neglected and lonely. And may God use you to do that as we pray and preach. And so as we close this morning, I want to introduce you to the six of our deacons who have been set apart and commissioned by our church. You guys can come up here right now. We followed this same pattern. Yeah. First Timothy 3 describes the role of deacons, servant leaders in the church. These brothers and sisters meet those qualifications, and we followed the pattern of Acts 6. Our church nominated and commissioned each of these leaders to lead uh, in different areas of ministry. And I'd love just briefly to share your name and what ministry you lead in the church. Hello. I'm Alyssa Whistle, and I lead the prayer ministry here. Hi, I'm Jen Yoon, and I oversee facilities. I'm Amy Merrickin, and I'm a deacon for community care. Hi, I'm Jess Pariseau, and I'm deacon over community engagement. Hey, y'all. 
I'm Nolan McGrady, and I also help with community care, and I'm also over the benevolence process. Good morning. My name's Iman, and I assist with Pastor David in the membership process and with RCC 101. And shameless plug, RCC 101's coming up next month, April 24th. <laughs> Consider joining our family. <laughs> well done. Let's give them a round of applause. We're so thankful for them. We're so thankful that you guys have stepped up to meet some needs in our church. And uh, as we close this morning, I'd love to just, like they do in Acts 6, commission them in a sense and pray for them. They've made a two-year commitment to our church uh, to serve in this capacity. And so we, we need the Spirit's help as you help lead and meet needs in the life of the city and the church. So would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for these wonderful men and women who are examples to us. And we pray, Lord, that you would commission them and send them by the power of your spirit to meet needs in our church family and around the city. Would you allow them to equip other leaders in the church to help meet needs with them? And may our church, though we have growing pains, reflect heaven as much as we can. May the city see us as a city on a hill shining and be drawn in. And may we display and declare the gospel well as we seek to bring more people, a growing number, to the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you. Oh, my, uh, yeah. As we close, I just want to encourage you not just only to look at these deacons who will be leading ministry in our church, but to look to the great deacon, Jesus Christ. The word deacon means servant. And Jesus came to serve us and to more than serve, to die for us. And so we do likewise, except in a different order. We die to self, and then we go serve, because he did it for us. Let's sing to our king.